Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this President's Choice uh, plenary session. Um, I did mention to you uh, in the General Assembly that this is a session that we uh, wanted to introduce. And I think it's very fitting that Kuching being a city about sustainability, equality uh, and inclusiveness uh, that we have today's topic. And I think you'll agree with me that earlier when we listened to the best marketing awards, the common thread that was there was really um, about how to improve our environment and how to get people and communities involved. So today's speaker is Professor Johannathan Janssen and he is speaking on building bridges in a broken and unequal world and what can leaders do. I'm not going to read his CV. You guys can all Google it. Um, and he told me not to do that. So with further, without any further ado, Professor Johansson, over to you. I'm really looking forward, and I know that the ICA guests and friends are also looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure to be here in Malaysia. Now, my name is Jonathan Jansen, and that in and of itself should raise questions, right? How does a black guy get a name like Janssen. So let me tell you the story. My maternal grandmother, this is true, her name was Coulson, is a descendant of Malay slaves. So the only reason I did something as stupid as flying from San Francisco for 30 hours, all in all, to be here in Kuching is because I thought I'd come and uh, 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 meet my, you know, my forebears. So far, no luck, but Coulson. The Janssen part, of course, uh, uh, comes from a Dutch ancestor. Anybody here from the Netherlands? Okay, yeah, there's my other cousins. But um, it is really, really good uh, to be here. And I thought you couldn't get farther, further away in the world from the bad news in my own country in South Africa and the bad news uh, in the country I'm in for a, uh, for a year, the United States. I just couldn't get further away from all the bad news of losing uh, every sports game except cricket against Australia. So I just thought to myself, you know, I'm sorry to the Australians here. We whacked you, man. Um, and you were praying for rain. But, um, uh, <coughs> and then I opened the Borneo Times. And it says, South African rugby team. In Kuching, beaten for the first time by England in 10 years. I said, what the fuck? How can you come so far to get such bad news? Anyway, it is lovely to be here. But, you know, in South Africa itself, um, my job is about people. So every day I go onto a campus with 33,117 students. And because I love being with people and I love students, you get overwhelmed, you know, by the... Uh, attention, people wanting to take selfies and questions. So I thought to myself, Kuching is as far away as you can get. You're going to have peace. I didn't want to wear this damn thing. I just wanted to be anonymous. So I get to the hotel yesterday and a woman comes to the book. She says, please, would you sign for me? I don't know where she's from. I said, oh, Lord, here we go again. So while I was signing, she says, I always wanted to meet you, Mr. James Earl Jones. So, you know, um, uh, who knows? Who knows? I tried to suggest I was Denzel, that didn't work, but um, anyway. So just to give you a little bit of a context for the talk, as I said, I work with uh, students and all my life, I've actually put myself in situations that are difficult, in which you are likely to get death threats, in which people either hate you or love you, and the way to do that in South Africa is to become a black man heading up a white university. I can assure you, you are in for trouble. So I did that as a dean, at the University of Pretoria, and more recently for seven years as a vice chancellor at the University of the Free State. And I went in, like most black South Africans, with a chip on my soldier, sh uh, uh, shoulder. I went in with this notion that I was right and they were wrong, that my job was to restore justice where there was injustice, to make right what history had made wrong. And I went in with that sense of justification for what I did. And I'm here today to talk to you about change. I'm here to tell you about a wonderful set of moments in which I came face to face with my own self as a leader, with the difficulties 
uh, in my own biography, with my own sense of guilt and shame, with my own sense of vulnerability. That's what I want to talk to you about because I wasn't changed by black people. I was changed by my white students, working with them, sensing in them my own self, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So this is going to be a difficult talk. It's going to be a hard talk, but I want to do this because whether it is South Africa or the Middle East, whether it is Northern Ireland or Trump's America, whether it is uh, Rwanda or Zimbabwe, we're all struggling at the moment in a very unequal and a very dangerous world with how to bring people together when their own stories, their own biographies are so different and so much in conflict. And unless we do it as leaders, I don't think we stand a chance of survival. It is much more dangerous than you think. And I want to use this little microcosm of life in the Mississippi of South Africa, where I worked in the center of the country, and share with you how change is in fact possible. There was nothing wrong with my vision. The problem was my values. There was nothing wrong with the how, the problem was the why. There was nothing wrong with the action. There was everything wrong with the attitude. And I want to talk to you about that. And so let me just clear the air first of all. All of you here, in whatever sector you might find yourself, you are leaders. If you are parents, you are leaders. If you run a company, you're a leader. If you're the head of a department, a small department in that company, you're a leader. If you're in your church, mosque, or synagogue, you are probably a leader. And so I don't want us to get the sense that leadership is political leadership only, or ecclesiastical leadership, or corporate leadership. Leadership at all these different levels is us. And so whatever I say to you today has to do with your leadership. Now, I love this picture. I was told that the only people here who are very talkative are the Australians. So I'm going to pretend I know what an Australian looks like. <laughs> Sir, what does this picture tell you? Uh, I'm from the UK, but... Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> One colony to another. <laughs> um, what do you see? I see uh, the President of the United States on his knees coming down to someone else's level, perhaps. Maybe it's a metaphor for imparting wisdom. Maybe it's just him playing with a baby. Um, perhaps it's a message about um, everyone coming onto one level and sharing the information on a, a singular plane. Maybe it's just a man with a child. You know what the Americans would call that answer? Covering all your bases. I like that. I like that. I like that. What do you see, sir? The leader should be uh, having fun, even with the, with the uh, baby. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is there a metaphor here, sir? Well, I think he's basically having fun with the baby and being equal with everybody. Right. And you, sir? I think generations meet. Oh, I like that. I like that. That's an A-level answer. What do you say, sir? You seem I level I level I level Say more, say more. I level Yeah, yeah, I level <laughs> Limited vocabulary, but what the hell. Um, so, here we go. There's all sorts of stuff going on here because when I saw this picture for the first time, I said, my Lord, there's a black guy and a white kid. <laughs> Sorry, I'm South African, so you see race in the tea leaves, you know. Um, there's a man I happen to know from the story. It's, it's a girl. It's a little girl, one of the staffers in Obama's administration. And there's the President of the United States and there's a very vulnerable little kid. I saw all of this stuff I saw history, I saw hope, I saw hype, as only Americans can do it. And I said to myself, what a beautiful story of leadership. And I like the notion of eye level. So I can lift up the baby to my level, or I can get down to her level and begin a baby conversation. So what did I learn from 22 years of leading in universities, mainly former white universities in South Africa, uh, that I hope can be of help to you as we think about the challenge of change. The first thing that I had to realize is that you cannot, in fact,
presume to change other people unless you have changed yourself. And so much of leadership is self-righteous. So much of leadership is I know and you don't. So much of leadership is telling rather than showing. And you cannot do that until you yourself have looked in the mirror. And I had a conversation about your own prejudice, your own biases, your own limitations. And this was so important as I met a young kid who came to see me at the University of Pretoria with her father, and she was white and poor, which you don't see often in my country. And there she sat, and I was the new black dean, and I thought I had a whole lot of power, and I thought I could, and then, and of course, you know, in my head at the time, I say this with great shame today, I was saying to myself, well, if you couldn't make it under apartheid, what the hell are you still doing here coming to ask me for scholarship funds? That's in my head. But of course, I won't say it. And the more this kid talked, and the more when she had dressed herself up, you know, and pulled her hair back, and, the fa and I looked at the father's shoes, and I saw he had two different colored shoelaces. He was from Pretoria West, which means poor. And I saw the tears in his eyes as he said to me, the black dean, could you help me please? Help me as a belief um, for my kind of beer to cry, to get my child a bursary. And in a split second, something happened which I can't explain to you. I no longer saw this white kid from Pretoria West. In a split second, I saw a conversation with my father on the Cape Flats, many years before that, in which I sat and I said to my dad, I want to go to university. He said, son, go. But I don't have a cent with which to send you. And in that moment when she was no longer visible to me through the accident, of the epidermis, but through the life of a struggling poor kid, I didn't see a white kid, I saw myself. Let me just tell you something. There is no way any of you here will be able to change this dark and dangerous world unless you have that conversation in which the other person is not Jewish, is not Muslim, is not gay or straight, is not somebody else. It is you. And that self-identification, that recognition of your brother and your sister changed me completely. And to this day, I am grateful for the insights I got, not from a textbook, but from living leadership in an unequal and a very dangerous society where even as we speak, universities are burning in South Africa just this morning. At a Cape Town University, the entrance to one of our big universities was petrol bombed in a very dangerous and unequal society. You cannot lead without personal sacrifice. Oh, just to show off, I sort of put up my family there. That's uh, my wife, Grace. And I can see all of you saying, why the hell did she marry that old guy? But, um, um, and my daughter, Sarah and my son, Mikhail. And the thing about sacrifice is that when you lead, now there are two ways of leading. You can take the easy route and not stir up anything. And just be cool and just have your conference and see the orangutans and go home. You can do that, it's called tourism. Or you can lead and ask the difficult questions, whether it's in your home, or whether it is in your workplace, and I can tell you this, you will have scars to show for it. It was in Corsi, or Chief Albert Lutuli, the first African to win the Nobel Prize, who said this after the apartheid government stripped him of his chieftainship. He said this, the way to freedom is via the cross. He wasn't making a religious statement. What he was saying is you're not going to get there unless there are sacrifices. As a leader at that point, was also the head of Nelson Mandela's African National Congress. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
who when he stood up to National Socialism in Hitler's Germany, who said that when Christ calls a man, he calls him to die. It was Dr. Adalat Khan, a Malaysian, an expert on Islamic leadership who said the greater the goal, the higher the price you pay to achieve it. And so there is no such thing as soft leadership. It is leadership that when you make that, so I know what it's like to get a call at 2 a.m. in the morning from a white racist saying you better clear your family out of Bloemfontein. We're coming for you. I know what it's like when my kids pick up that phone. I know what it's like when you're not sure what's going to happen next. But how else do you change a dangerous place unless it is done with sacrificial leadership? The other thing I have to understand is that you cannot change anything as a leader unless you understand the plight of other people, the person on the other side. And so what did I do? In this very large university with a history of racism and horrific racial incidents, I joined it in 2009 after one such incident, and I decided that what I'm going to do every day is to, instead of sitting in my office and pretending to be important, I was going to sit outside and wait for people to come and talk to me. And they came. And some came to talk about their academics, others came to talk about their finances, and quite a few about their romantic uh, dilemmas. Be that as it may, I was out there sitting, and the more I listened to these kids, the more I understood what it means to be black and poor, despite the revolution promised in 1994. I understood what it meant to be white, and to constantly be told you're white, and you're worthless, and you're privileged. I knew what it meant to be disabled, and not to know how to access a building that was rigged for people who don't have physical disabilities. And so sitting out there, let me tell you, if you're going to lead anywhere, spend a good amount of your time, not with your budgets, there's enough clever people who can do that for you, but with your people and listen to them and understand what it means to lead by listening to the people around you. Let me say this. You cannot lead without using all the diversity of resources at your proposal. I want you to look at my core team on the left-hand side. There are Muslims and Jews and Christians and even a few vegetarians in that team. <laughs> I made a conscious decision that 70% of my core management team would be women. I get irritated out of my mind when I come to conferences and I see everybody on show. Most of the people on show happen to be men. I don't like that. You cannot build a successful organization. This is not sociology 101, this is just common sense 101. Unless you draw on the full range of resources available to you. And boy did that work. And it's not just about putting people in there, but it's about supporting them in all their diversity. And this was tough. And you know what was the toughest thing to change at this university, which is 111 years old? The diet. Because everybody thought that everybody else ate red meat over a barbecue, and they would make a joke in those parts of South Africa, if we want a salad, we'll kill a pig. Okay, that's the wrong example in Malaysia, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and so they prided themselves on being exclusive, on being separate, on having their own culture. But you cannot change an organization unless you not only bring in the right people and the diversity of people, but of course bring in the kind of cultural adjustments that make everybody feel that it's their institution, it's their place. And that is something very good. On the far right-hand side, this is a, one of my treasured pictures. Again, if you understand the, that only as late as 1989, my university had its first black undergraduate student. 
That's the other day. And recently, the students selected, which meant a whole lot of white students, the first black woman president, right in the middle. And the lady on the right, the first blind student, so also an athlete in the Paralympics. She runs uh, long distance. And her boyfriend on the right, who happens to be a member of the ANC. If you want to try and understand that, it's going to take me a whole lot of time. Uh, to explain, but in order to change an organization, you cannot rely on people simply because of their genitalia. You have to rely on them because of the diversities that they bring into the place. And let me make this clear. You cannot lead unless you are being led. Now, there's a whole lot of nonsense you will pick up in airport bookshops about leadership. And it normally goes something like this. It's what we call the, you know, the big man theory of leadership. And so you pick up Jack Welch's book, and it would say, well, I came in, I took the company by the scruff of the neck, I turned deficits into profits, I fired off the people, and voila! <laughs> That's a load of bull. That's not leadership. That used to work with the apes. It does not work with human beings. That's not how you change an organization. Actually, leaders, at the best of times, are weak. They're vulnerable. They're uncertain. They don't know what to do next. Ever been in a major crisis? Talk to me. You tell me you've got a playbook for exactly what's going to happen next? You don't. And so when that happens as a leader, here's my question. What? Do you rely on to steer you? I asked the question the other day on my Facebook page, is your online self the same as your offline life? What is that core set of values, of commitments that steer you in the dark? America has just chosen a president who has no core values. He'll say whatever, the typical populist, he'll say whatever you want to hear. Today is for abortion, the next day is against abortion. He'll say whatever you want to hear. That's not leadership, that's opportunism. What are those core sets of values? And so what I did after seven years, when I decided to leave, I called together all of the people, students, Many of them now graduated. And I said, I want you to come because each one of you has in a different way enabled me to lead. And they were very surprised. And then I told them, spent a whole hour telling them, uh, so you see the woman in the wheelchair? She's the head of our university's rugby team. Any questions? So here. Lesejo Chopin. And she taught me how the architecture of the place was not designed for her. So what did they do? They arrested us one day as leaders in the middle of an exco meeting, and they assigned to each one of us a disability. Some of us were told, you're going to be blind for the day. Others had to move around in a wheelchair for the day. By the end of that exhausting day, we decided to change the entire university's architect because clearly it was not designed for people with disabilities. She taught me about disabilities. There's a student in there. On the far left in the middle. Her name is Tanya Carlett. She's white, she's Afrikaans, and she comes from a God-forsaken place called Boxburg. It's the biblical equivalent of Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of there. With my birthday, my secretary said, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I've got an awkward situation. I said, what's awkward? She says, there's a student outside here with a bucket of water and a towel. She wants to see you. I said, I showered this morning. What's the problem? <laughs> she said she's a deeply devout Christian. And as her act of servant leadership, underline servant leadership, she would like to wash your feet. Because I grew up as a Christian in an evangelical setting. 
I cried throughout that session. And I want you to look at the imagery here. I want you to look at South Africa after apartheid. I want you to look at the unlikely uh, story of a white Afrikaans girl from a very conservative home wanting to express her leadership through service. I so much wanted to tell her to go away, but of course I couldn't. There is, in this group, a student. He's a young doctor, he's right at the back, in the middle, who decided that as his public duty as a white kid, he's going to go into Kailicha in Cape Town, one of the largest sprawling informal settlements, squatter camps in South Africa, and that he's going to deliver babies for women as a personal service. He doesn't have to do it. He could live very comfortably in Seapoint or Upper Cape Town and nobody would bother him. But it was his devotion to go there. So from each one of these students, I don't have time, I would tell you how they have changed my life. Through their leadership. You cannot lead unless you are being led unless you are being led. And so, I have a challenge for you today. Instead of complaining about poverty and inequality and unemployment in the world, just imagine what would happen if this conference with its enormous expertise, I sat through one of the first presentations with the marketing thing, I think it was the colleagues from New Zealand. I was so impressed, not with their rugby team, but with their presentation. And I said to myself, there is too much expertise in this room, too much resources to come to a second tier destination. I learned that phrase from you guys, like Kuching and live as if nothing happened. Just imagine you deployed the resources here to make sure that there is a durable social impact after you leave. Just imagine that a conference with this kind of expertise says we're going to go to the poorest part of Kuching and we're going to take talented young people and make them a part of this conference and assign mentors to them so that they can become part of, I don't know what you call it, is it rats? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Mice. Mice. Right. <laughs> I, knew I knew it was some rodent. <laughs> Just imagine you took the enormous resources of this group and you went to the Middle East for your, one of your next conferences and you insisted that the young people who come together to develop innovative technologies around mice, that you insisted that they were Arabs from Palestine and Jews. From Just imagine you came to South Africa and you insisted on that with black and white youth. In other words, Please don't waste the time of the developing world by coming in, having a conference, and running off. Use your resources to make an impact. There is too much talent in this room to walk away. What is my message to you today? It's very, very simple. Stop complaining about the problems of the world and lead from where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Janssen. Is there anybody in the audience that has a question? Um, there's no holds barred. I think any language goes. Vegetarians are allowed to ask questions. So,
and the back. I can't run with these hills. Sorry, guys. Prof. Go ahead, sir. Oh, where are you? Okay. Um, how do you manage the situations when uh, somebody is wrong and somebody else is right? In okay. your university, for example. All right. So, <laughs> I think, uh, thank you very much for the question. Now, now, South Africans are very opinionated. They have a view on everything from the weather to, you know, exactly who's not playing right in the local uh, sports team to the politician has got to go. We are very opinionated. South Africans will tell you what you think even before you ask them anything, okay? This is true. So we're very Australian in that sense. So I, um, <laughs> sorry guys. Um, and I think the first thing that we did was to establish after that horrible racial incident an institute for justice and reconciliation social justice and reconciliation. You're welcome to check it out on the website. And the purpose of the institute was to say, before you come in with an opinion who's right and wrong, how about we just talk? Okay? Because you have an interesting problem in South Africa that white South Africans believe they were screwed by history, by the English, which is more or less most of you. Um, and then you have black South Africans, of course, who believe they were screwed by white people in general and Afrikaans people in particular. And so you can't have a conversation when you have what Eva Hoffman in a beautiful book after such knowledge calls the clash of martyrological memories. In other words, everybody's a martyr. Everybody's got a story about pain. And so the purpose of the institute is to bring young people together and every single day there's 50, 60, 70 young people, black and white, who get together there to listen to each other's stories. Not to venture an opinion, just to listen to each other's stories because when you start off from the notion, as I did, that you're right and everybody else is wrong, there are no grounds for conciliation, let alone for conversation, and so on. So that's the way I think you do it. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, so I take my, uh, the advice of my cousin really serious. <laughs> uh, and my, uh, my question is not to you, Mr. Janssen, my, uh, my question is to Nina. So what is ICAS going to do in Prague? Could you explain that uh, following the advice of my cousin? And then maybe my cousin can react on this. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do in Prague? 2017. Around the challenge, I suspect, that I put at the end about how the conference itself can have a lasting... The conference itself in Prague should be of significance to what's happening in Prague. Right. That, uh, that's my basic understanding of what you said. So I'm going to ask you, Eric, to help me find a solution because it's not only about me, it's about us leading everyone at the end of the day. And I don't have all the, the answers and feel like the... Uh, the small leader at the end of the day. So I think it's really about the collaboration. What do we do? Because we don't know the answers. I mean, the other thing that we touched on and in the General Assembly, we touched on the fact that freedom of speech, freedom of movement, and including everybody, um, that was just not a flippant um, comment that was made. It was discussed at board level. So that we do want to make sure that all board members can go to all parts in the world. How will Brexit affect people going to Prague what will happen in Dubai, and that's further deliberation and then the other impact further. But I think it's a, it's a, a joint effort. How do we address that? I actually don't know. So if that answers your question at all. Yeah, I, I love to hear the... Uh, yeah, so cousin to cousin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what is very, very important is to deal with, and I think my, perhaps Nina was hinting at that, I think the thing that worries me most about Europe at the moment is the issue of migration. You've got to be able to talk about migration uh, in a way that addresses, on the one hand, the, the desperation of people, you know, fleeing uh, uh, persecution, poverty, certain death in places like Syria, and at the same time, the fears of people. Because, you know, the one thing the left has to get right 
is not dismissing uh, people who have genuine fears of their own. I think this is where Hillary Clinton made a huge mistake, in my view, is to dismiss this group of people as a basket of deplorables. Some of them, no doubt, were and are, but there are real issues here about how do you deal with that kind of, of fear. But I can't believe you can talk about Europe for the next 10 to 20 years without addressing whether it's in Prague or in surrounding European states, the issue of migration, which is a painful, painful issue for millions, as you know. And it's even more so because of the rise of the right, whether it's Gerd Wilders in the Netherlands or Marine Le Pen in France. This, these people scare me, and you've got to be able to speak through that in the way you organize your conferences and who you bring into those conferences to address these issues. So I'm going to be here for another couple of hours, so if you want sure. to have a cousinly beer, I'd be quite happy <laughs> to. Well, my, my first suggestion to Nina is then let's, let's invite 50 refugees I love it. plus 50 people that don't like them to be there. I have a conversation. Yeah. Good. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Corinne Maxfield from William Angus in Melbourne. Um, I have another suggestion too. Firstly, thank you to IGA for providing the opportunity for students to come along. And uh, I know the students uh, from my institute that's here have, have just found it an amazing experience. But I think that's another, a real opportunity to perhaps invite more students from the developing countries. There may not be specific event management courses there, but there will definitely be general business, you know, studied all over the world. And that's a great opportunity to build up um, education in those countries as well. So that could be looked at. Thank you. Let me just, in support of your proposal, just say this. Um, and maybe it's because it's a function of aging, but you begin to become aware of replacement leadership. And I don't know, as an international student myself at one point, of something that better breaks the, the bonds of, of, of prejudice than being exposed to other cultures and traveling and so on. So I love, I love that idea very much for what it's worth. Nothing from the left, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone over there. Goodness me, you must have been in the Malaysian middle distance. Uh. So it, thank you, first of all, for the great session. It was very inspiring. And I, th I think the standing ovation showed as well that we all really appreciated it. And it seems like you have this whole leadership thing figured out fairly well. But did you ever run into a situation where you felt, this is too challenging. I cannot do this. I'm not the one who can lead this situation. All the time. All the time. I'm glad you asked that because that goes to the point I made about the misimpression of leadership as being certain and fixed and reliable and predictable. It's not. And so when I end up in those moments in which I am unsure, I have to draw on the resources of young people, the resources of my faith, the resource, shaky as it is, the resources of other leaders and so on. So all the time, any leader that tells you that he or she has figured it out, don't trust them. Okay? As I said, you've got a, a man who's a president now of, of the, free, the leader of the free world, uh, to use their own expression, and if you think about it, Okay. He knows exactly, like any populist, you come up with three messages. One is the problems are simple. Two, the enemy is clear. Muslims, migrants, I mean, you know. And number three, I'm your savior. That's not leadership. That's a hoax. Leaders are unsure at the best of times. And when you get into that space, you have to lean on others. And I do that all the time. So no, I don't have it figured out. I really apologize if it came across that way. just wanted to say um, with regards to um, the conference survey is that please can you tell us what you want because we have I don't think we've ever gone into too much politics and we've touched on it but I think it would be remiss if we 
if we just try and ignore it and only talk about best business practice at the end of the day, because these things do affect us uh, in the various environments that we do work in. Um, and if we don't get the feedback, we don't know what to put in. So if you can please tell us, and if the survey doesn't allow you to do that, then just send an email um, to me, to any of the board members, because we can't fix it and if there are solutions. And I completely concur that in this audience, there are much more clever people than me and maybe even some of the board members um, here. So please, we really want the feedback and the information. We can only lead and make changes in this organization if we get that feedback from you. So I'm going to say thank you because it's nearly lunchtime and we love to eat here in Malaysia. But Professor Janssen, so lovely to have you here. Thank you, everybody. I hope that you also enjoyed it. Uh, and thanks for traveling all the way. Thank you.